Sally Peterson's brother, our son, Bobby, uh, was diagnosed with cancer this week. Obviously, as a mom, it's a big concern when your adult children are sick and you can't be there with them. So uh, pray for Bobby. Bobby needs a lot of help, uh, not just in his body, but in his spirit and peace as well. So pray for pray for him and pray for Paul Husky uh, dealing with some health issues right now. Pretty serious stuff. We want the Lord to be with Paul and Lisa Husky tonight. This is Lydia's um, father, uh, if you're not familiar with Paul. Want the Lord to minister to him. Somebody else, Terry Cross, Susan Cross. Chris uh, Grimshaw, Tim Grimshaw. Let's pray for Mary's cousin in Wyoming, dealing with leukemia in the hospital tonight. Pray for her. Amen. Dean. Steve's got an unspoken request for us. Thank you. Neil Neil and Clarice uh, have been in Minnesota, I believe, at Mayo for weeks, dealing with his cancer situation. So just pray for them. Why don't you stand right now? If you're online with us, just key it into the comments. We'll pray for you as well. Let's ask the Lord to touch these needs together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your peace, your provision in our lives. Lord, everything we need is in your hands. And I thank you for being our strength. Lord, what we need is in you. We trust you right now to do what is perfect, Lord, what is right. Lord, we commit Paul Husky into your hands. You see this very serious situation that he's dealing with. Lord, I pray that you would do something good for him. Lord, go to the source of the infection. 
rebuke it tonight, Lord Jesus. Lord, I ask you to be with Bobby. Lord, you see the cancer that he's dealing with. You see Mary's cousin dealing with leukemia tonight. Serious situations, Lord, and we're trusting you to be their help. Touch their spirits, touch their bodies right now. Lord, we commit Patty Dodd into your hands. Harold, James, Lord, you see the strength that they need in their bodies. We're trusting you, Lord, to be their healer right now, to be their strength. Lord, we commit uh, Clarice and Neil into your hands. You know what's happening in their lives today. Lord, you know what uh, Neil needs in his life. Lord, I pray for strength and peace for Clarice today. Lord, you know what's going on in the Grimshaw family. Pray that you minister to them. Lord, be strength to Tim today, to uh, Carissa. Ask you to minister in their lives exactly what they need, Jesus. Lord, we commit Steve's need into your hands. Lord, every one of us. Lord, any other condition, any other situation, family, job, financial, whatever it is, Lord, you are able to supply it. We give you the glory and the praise right now for doing exactly what we need done. Lord, we give you all the praise and the glory right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. You may be seated. We can have Sarah in the house. Rocking and rolling. I haven't seen her forever. It's good to see her. Visiting, visiting friends. Series 2.3 is where we are. Our refuge and strength. Remember, we're working through several psalms today uh, throughout this month. And today we're in Psalms 46. Our lesson idea is that we're trusting the Lord to be our refuge and strength. And I just want to read through Psalms 46, all 11 verses of it. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed. I'm reading from a, uh, I believe the New King James Version uh, translation here. And through the mountain, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. <laughs> I just gave that to you for fun. And though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, though the waters roar and give troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling sea law, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn, right in the nick of time. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. See that, think about that. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot with fire. And then we hear from the Lord himself, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The Lord's going to help us. The Lord's going to help us. That's what Psalms 46 is all about. I'm curious tonight. We're going to be talking about a family, a uh, royal family, in the book of Chronicles. And Second Chronicles is where we're going to, to rest tonight, along with Psalms 46. Well, this family had uh, a number of issues, as does any family. Hezekiah, in Second Chronicles 32, had watched his father Ahaz destroy the work of God in the kingdom of Israel. And I wonder tonight, how much of a role did your family play in your walk with God? Coming to know the Lord, perhaps, or uh, once you once you uh, got to know the Lord, bringing you into the uh, into greater knowledge or uh, faith in the Lord. Because in the case of Ahaz, he did nothing 
In fact, he was a detriment, a negative sign in Hezekiah's walk with God. We actually don't know where Hezekiah's faith came from. Where did this faith grow in his heart? As Ahaz was buried after 16 years of destructive tendencies in the in the uh, the country of Judah, Ahaz couldn't have been any different than his son in what his son came to be. Second Chronicles 28 and 1 says, Ahaz had been wicked and did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, and that was not a good thing. Because up to this point, it had been pretty nasty. He'd forsaken the Lord. He'd, he had worshipped the gods of the surrounding pagan cultures. And in fact, whenever he went to pay uh, tribute, taxes to the Assyrian king, while he was there, he found a, a, uh, a, an altar that he really liked. And so he came home with the plans for this altar and had the priest build this altar that he saw in this pagan Syrian uh, temple and put that in the temple of God. He offered his children as burnt sacrifices and uh, he put together, gathered together, the scripture says, the vessels of the house of God, cut the pieces of, cut, cut the vessels in half, shut up the doors of the house of the Lord, made him altars on every corner of the city of Jerusalem. In every city in, Jerus in Judah, he made high places to burn incense unto other gods and provoked to anger the Lord God of his fathers. Unbelievable. But Ahaz dies after 16 years, and Hezekiah takes his place and immediately does what is right in the sight of the Lord. We know this because the scripture says in the first month that he was in power, he immediately went to the temple and started cleaning things up. He was, uh, he had a plan knowing I suppose knowing that his father was going to pass away, his father wasn't that old, he was just in his 40s, but knowing that his father was going to be passing away, he had a plan in place whenever I get to my father's throne, when I assume the kingship, this is what I'm going to do. He gathered the priests and the Levites together. He said, you need to consecrate yourselves, get ready to be in the service of the temple. You need to purify it. It took them 16 days to clean out and consecrate the temple. It was such a mess. He restores what the, the scripture says is right or righteous worship, eliminates the false worship, removes the altars from Jerusalem, and the crown of his restoration process, of his, his uh, program, to restore was Passover. And when we've talked about how important Passover was to uh, the celebrations and to the feasts of the children of Israel. And they had missed the, 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 the normal date for Passover because they were trying to get everything cleaned up and they couldn't get it done in time. And so it was a couple of months after, but he said, you know what, we're going to celebrate Passover anyway because it's so important for us. And he sent out a, a message to the entire region, not just to Judah, not just to the Manasseh and, the, and, and Benjamin, but to Israel as well. Now, remember, we have two separate kingdoms. We've got Judah and we've got Israel. We've got a split. We've got a civil war. And he says, I'm not just going to send it to my people, but I'm going to send it to everybody in Israel. Y'all come. We've cleaned up the temple. It's time to have church. Somebody come join with us. And people did. And when they got there, they weren't consecrated. They weren't ready. They hadn't purified themselves. But Hezekiah said, you know what, God? I'm going to ask you to be merciful to these people because they're trying. They're making an attempt to reconnect with you. They may not be exactly where they need to be according to the law of Moses, but can we just accept them for where they are right now? And the Lord honored that king's request. 
They sacrificed. Remember, they had to, to, to kill a lamb. The, the, the people who weren't consecrated or weren't uh, purified, the, the, the priests did that for them. They made allowances to try to get these people, as many people involved in the restoration of the worship of God as they could. 2 Chronicles 31.20 says, And this did Hezekiah through all Judah, and wrought or did what was good and right and true before the Lord his God. And in every work that he began the service of God and the law and the commandments to seek God, he did it with all his heart, and he prospered. A little side note, in 29, 2 Chronicles 29, he's giving a speech to the Levites. And he's basically, he's pulled them all together. It, I mean, think about being in the office and your boss calls you into the break room and says, guys, we need to have a meeting. We're in a conference room, we're on Zoom, whatever. Everybody, I, I want to set the record straight on where we're, what, what we're doing next. And he says, one of the things he says in, in verse 6 of 29, he says, Our parents were unfaithful. They did evil in the eyes of the our Lord. They forsook him. And in verse 10, he says, Now I intend to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, so that his fierce anger will turn away from us. Mom and dad didn't do it right. Folks before us messed it up. But I'm intending to make a change, and I'm asking you to join with me in making this change in hopes that the Lord's anger against our country will be reversed. A little side note here on Hezekiah's life. If your family history does not indicate following the will and the, and the, the blessing of God, you can change that. Hezekiah's uh, life is a testimony to us today that you can choose to serve the Lord regardless of what your family history looks like. No, no, no matter how many generations back it goes, you can change the places of addiction, of family curses, of family history in your life that were destructive and make them righteous. You can set up a temple, an altar to the Lord in your life for your next generation to follow, to be able to point and say, hey, mom or dad did this in order to change our cycle, whatever that is, the cycle of destruction. Now, of course, it would seem right that God would bless Hezekiah for what he did. He was the king. He was the authority over the, 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 the country of Judah. So naturally, God's going to bless him, and he's going to, as the scripture says, prosper. End of story, by the same token. Except, life does not treat us this way. He had peace, he had prosperity for 14 years. And then, bad news. The Assyrians, who were a terrible people, they were kingdom builders, not in the positive sense. They would destroy and assimilate whatever kingdom that they conquered. They had invaded Judah, and they were bent on destruction of everything in their path, including the city of Jerusalem. And you could ask yourself, how could this be? How could God allow this to happen? He's been doing everything he's supposed to do. He's serving God. And in this experience... True devotion, pure devotion, faith in God does not equal a trouble-free existence. That is not the way this works. In this life, you will have trouble, and his trouble was like the Assyrian army on not cruise control, but flat out running toward his destruction. Psalms 46 and 1, we're going to repeat this over and over Hezekiah found out that God is his refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. I mentioned that Ahaz had um, tried to connect with the Assyrians at one point. He had a number of enemies that were attacking him, the Edomi Edomites on one side and the Moabites on the other, I think, and uh, it, was, it was pretty chaotic. The Philistines were doing their thing as they normally did, kind of like the hyenas kind of nipping at the, the feet 
the, the, the ankles of Judah. And so he appeals to the Assyrians because they were the largest uh, force at the time. Now remember, this is Ahaz, this is Hezekiah's dad. And he had appealed to them to come and, and, and just, just bring the hammer down on all these guys. Just, just wipe everything out. Give me some peace because I can't make it happen on my own. The irony is he could have done it with the help of the Lord, but he didn't have that. And so he c- becomes kind of a vassal state, a serfdom to the Assyrians. And he's paying this yearly tribute to, uh, the, um, to the Assyrians and to their gods. Hezekiah becomes king, and he says, you know what, I'm not going to do this anymore. Second Kings, remember, there's, there's two storylines that we have here in the scripture. We have the Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles. We have First and Second Kings, which are parallel storylines. You get a little bit more detail in one than the other, depending on what the story is. In Second Kings 18, it says that Hezekiah rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him, didn't pay him tribute. Basically said, my dad started this thing, and this is not the story we're going to have. We're going to put an end to this story and shut the book and walk out. And so Sennacherib says, you know, well, that's not the way this is going to work. I, I got used to getting this money from you. You're going to pay up. So he's attacking all of these fortified cities around Judah. And whenever he shows up to, uh, it, when he's, he's headed toward Jerusalem, Hezekiah starts a military building project that rivals anything since David. He thinks that he's going to pay off Sennacherib. He's like, maybe if, if, we, if we throw him a bone, maybe he'll go away. But that doesn't work at all. And so as a man who's trusting in God, 2 Kings 18 and 5 says, he trusted the Lord God of Israel so that there was none after him or before him among all the kings of Judah. Trusting in the Lord did not mean he didn't do anything. He didn't just sit in his castle and go, well, I believe the Lord's going to take care of us, so I'm just going to sit here and wait to see what he does. He took action. He tried diplomacy. That didn't work. So if we know we're going to get attacked, I'm going to do something about it. If you have termites in your house, no amount of Positive thinking is going to convince those insects to leave your premises. Lord, I believe that you designed those insects to destroy my house. And I'm asking you to do something about these insects. I have. Go thee to Walmart and buy the insect repellent. But, Lord, I'm asking you to do something about it. Would you please come in and take care of these termites? Go to Walmart and buy the insect repellent. Why won't you do something about this, God? I have. I've given you a tool to use. And Hezekiah is a perfect example of this. He looks for ways that he can protect what God has given him. First, Try diplomacy, that doesn't work. And so he cuts off the water supply. This is in 2 Chronicles 32, if you're following along. Outside the city, he brings everybody together. He says, let's cut off the spring that's on the outside of the city. And today, that tunnel is still there today, bringing the water from the outside of the city into the city of Jerusalem. And then he starts going about fortifying the city itself doing whatever he can, all the while, Lord, I'm doing my best with what I've got. You're going to have to fill in the blanks. He builds the wall. Uh, He repairs places where it had been broken down. He builds towers that his soldiers can fight from. And he adds a completely different wall, another wall around the city. He even starts a ammunition or uh, supply building where he's building swords, he's got shields, he's putting everything he can together 
in order to build a defense against this guy. Now, I don't know if we can fault uh, fault Hezekiah for trying to take on Sennacherib in every capacity he can. Maybe you can say, well, it's a lack of faith. But I don't see it that way. I see him doing what he has in his hand. This is what the scripture says. What do you have in your hand? Whatever you put your hand to, do it according to the Lord. He was doing whatever he could in wisdom that he had for the love of his people, the love of his country, trying to solve this issue and trusting the Lord at the same time. I'm trusting you, Lord, to do what I cannot do. So the physical city, the defenses of the city are in place. And then he turns to the people. And I love what he did. This is a great leader. Because he doesn't look at the people and go, things are really bad and everything's going to fall apart if you don't get your act together. So snap it together. Come on, let's go. He comes at them not on the focus of their abilities, on the focus of their valor. you got to be brave, guys. Come on. Pull your, you know, gird your loins, whatever the, the Old Testament term was. He didn't focus on everything that he had done to fortify the city and to give them more shields and more swords, et cetera, et cetera. His encouragement was nothing on the natural. His encouragement was completely on the Lord. Let's go to 2 Chronicles 32 and 7. Be strong and courageous, he says. Be not afraid or dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor all the multitude that was with him. For there is more with us than there is with him. His perspective was, we're looking to God to be our help because we have steadfastly looked to him for deliverance. You need to be strong and courageous. And at first glance, it may seem like he's, he's, he's saying, we're, we're going we're to look at what we've got numerically. we got more in the pot than he does. And that was not the case at all. The Assyrian army was massive. His point was not in the physical that we have more within the walls of Jerusalem, but who that is with us. Look at verse 8. With him, with the Assyrian army, is the arm of flesh. But with us is the Lord our God who will help us, and he will fight our battles. Amen. And there was this groundswell of support, of of encouragement, of courage that happens throughout the the whole group of of people that were sheltering there with him. He wasn't just putting on a bold face of, you know, it's a desperate time. I've got to steal myself. You know, we can do this. You know, don't let the kids know how bad things really are. He was truly saying, this is what I believe. In 32 and 8, the rest of that verse says, and the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, the king. Rested themselves. That means they took comfort. I want you to think about this, and Stephen's going to talk a little bit more about this, but I want you to think about this in your own life. Whenever things go south, do you give those around you words to rest on? Whenever things get a little chaotic in your life, and maybe the bills are not where they need to be, or maybe the car's not doing what it's supposed to do, do you provide some place of rest for those who are looking to you for leadership. Uh, Evan Zanoba is a youth uh, editor for our uh, Pentecostal publishing house. We're going to jump to a video. He's going to answer the question about Hezekiah's example and how it reveals the power of one person's faith. In looking at the story of Hezekiah, His faith was never once in question. He's a great leader. He is a uh, someone who pushes faith, pushes understanding of God's word, his commandments. It has never been in question. It's never been misunderstood 
what Hezekiah represented in the grand scheme of Israel and the Bible and, and taking a stand for what is right, in his restoration of the law, in his restoration of the temple, Hezekiah took a stand for what was true and what was right in God's eyes. This reveals a couple of things to me. First and foremost, I would tell you that Hezekiah, even though he was king, even though he was leader, um, there were certainly going to be people that did not follow him if he was not strong in his convictions. Hezekiah's faith and understanding of what God wanted drove him to share those convictions with the nation, to bring them back from an off-track course to in will with what God desired for his people. In spite of everything, Hezekiah's faith drove others to be faithful like him. And that is incredible. But there's also something else that I believe that Hezekiah's story reveals to us as people of faith and people of God. Hezekiah's faith did not begin when he became king, when he was elected by God to rule the nation. Because the Bible tells us that, that on the first day of the first year of his reign that Hezekiah acted in faith and began to put these rules and regulations in place and bring Israel to where it needed to be. But Hezekiah's faith began before that. It began in a prayer room, in a personal relationship with God. And before Hezekiah began his rule, before he was elevated to a place of purpose, his faith took hold within his heart, within his habits. It was a foundation for everything that he built his life on so that when he finally became ruler, Hezekiah's faith could shine in all of its glory of what God intended for it to be. Christine is going to move more into that concept of what you're doing with your life before you get to that place of purpose. It's good for us to think about that. I want you to spend some time thinking about that. But I, I want to go back for a moment and, and pause on that be strong and courageous statement that Hezekiah sent out to his people. It should sound familiar, be strong and courageous, because we've heard this line before from others. Moses, uh, when he's facing the Red Sea, the Egyptians are bearing down on the children of Israel, and just they are terrified at what is about to happen. His response to them is in Exodus 14 and 13, fear not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Get ready to see what God is about to do. The Lord's going to fight for you. You hold your peace and let him do what only he can do. And that be of good courage, be strong and courageous. Moses used that same term when he was talking to Joshua. When he's getting ready to, Moses is getting ready to transition out of the picture and Joshua is getting ready to step into a place of leadership, Moses' response to him is not, well, you, I did what I could, but you are really in a world of hurt. Those aren't words to rest on. Words to rest on are be of good courage, be strong and courageous. In Joshua chapter 1, God gives him the same message. I'm with you. I'm walking with you just like I did with everybody else. I'm not going to leave you by yourself. You've done what you're supposed to do, and I'm, I'm glad that you've made the effort that you've done. But be strong and of good courage. David, whenever he's getting ready to transition out of the kingship, he's going to literally pass away. Solomon's getting ready to step into the throne room. David's uh, push to him is be of good courage. Be strong and courageous. You can do this. Over and over and over again, we see the Lord giving the people of Israel the opportunity to not only do what they can, but to be courageous in him. I hope we're finding some strength and some promises tonight. The Lord still fights for his people. He's still our refuge today. And all of you have a testimony of where the Lord has been your strength. He's been a present help in trouble. 
Paul in Romans 15, 4. It says, for whatsoever things were written before were written for our learning, that we could have patience and comfort of the scriptures. We could have some hope. He understood what the Old Testament was designed to do. It's a testimony to us of what these people went through and what we can use, glean from that is, well, 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. These things all happened to them as examples. They were written for our admonition, our admonition because who we are, we're the ones on whom the ends of the world are coming. We can trust the Lord. If he did it for them, he'll do it for us. Be strong and of good courage. John, writing to the believers in 1 John 4 and 4, says, Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Really echoing what Hezekiah said when he was standing in front of all of those people wrapped around by this huge military building project, doing whatever he could to provide safety for his people and knowing full well whatever I do is worthless if the Lord isn't in it. I can mix the mortar, but I've got to have your spirit to do the work. Think about this. What, what promise of Scripture have you found yourself repeating in a time of turmoil or just in your daily walk with the Lord? When you get up in the morning, whatever affirmations you're speaking into the mirror as you're getting ready for your day, what is it you're pulling out of Scripture as a promise that the Lord has given you to encourage you and to give you strength? Anybody want to share one out of curiosity? Give you the option. Be strong and be courageous because the Lord is with you. And if you don't have something like that, take something from this lesson tonight and put that on a post-it note so whenever you get to that point of, oh, dear God, I'm going to be strong and courageous. I am thankful that we have a God that helps us fight our battles. And like Scott was saying in Psalm 46, verse 1, the, ex the psalmist expressed the words, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. And so it's important to note that this verse says that God is our help in trouble, but he never said we would go without trouble. And so he doesn't necessarily promise that we won't have to go through anything, but he promises that he will be with us as we're going through what we're going through. And so the trouble that will inevitably come our way as we live in this fallen world, the trouble that may come our way, even as we live righteously as Hezekiah did, while seeking God with all our hearts, can still exist. Most of us can testify that we have had some troubles in our life. And during those times, are we looking for Scooby and the gang to come rescue us? Are we uh, leaning to the world's rationale of their way of thinking to get us through? Or are we leaning on Lord Jesus to be our present help? See, there's a lot of things in this world that we can lean upon. There's a lot of things that we can uh, turn to that's pulling us here or pulling us there. But there's only one thing in this world that has a sure foundation. And only one thing that's our ever-present help in time of trouble, and that's God, who we depend upon. Have you ever needed to rely upon God in a very present help in a time of present trouble? Anyone want to share a time that, that, man, I need the Lord to take care of this right now. I know just, a, what, two months ago, Kristen and I, or myself, were walking, and we were walking through the neighborhood, and it was, it was a quiet street, so we are walking along the road, and, you know, we have Isaac with us running each and every way, Nora's in the stroller, as we're pushing her along. And as we're walking, we come up to this house, and it was a nice house, but as we're approaching it, I see this dog that's at full attention, 
And my parents used to raise dogs, so I was a little familiar. This was a German shepherd. It was a, it looked like a well-aged German shepherd. And it was at full attention, and as soon as I seen it, like, my heart was knowing something was not how it should be. And so this German shepherd ends, ends up running down their front yard. He runs into the road where we are, and he is barking viciously. Like, he's not just saying woof, woof. He's woof, 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 woof. Like, he's right by my side. And so the dog would be on my left side as Kristen and the kids are on this side. And at that time, I didn't have me a little doggy bone to give him. And I don't think that's what he was after. But that dog was very vicious, and I don't know if he was territorial or what, but at that time, the only thing I could do is instantly be praying, Lord Jesus, right now I declare your protection, like in an earnest manner, like not a lay me sleep down a kind of prayer. That was an intense moment. And the thing was, is I don't know if this was a setup or what, but I had just heard two traumatic events and seen the stories of two different individuals that had been severely mauled by two different dogs. And so at that moment, the flashes of what could occur at this moment was running through your mind. But in that time, I don't got time to think about that. I just know the one who can protect us. And so as I'm praying, Lord Jesus, right now, I clear protection. Like, let's walk this way. Like, we ain't sticking around to find out what this guy's up to. And so we... Now, at that time, you know, we're just on a a walk. I'm in the middle of the road. There's not even an option to pick up a stick. I felt so defensive, defenseless, defenseless, let me get that out, in my own power, but I felt the strength from the Lord because as we were walking, that dog stayed right there. While he was literally right next to me, and I thought he was about to chomp me into the little bitty pieces. But as we walk, and as I walk back, I watch, and that dog is staying there. Like, we're already 40 yards away, and he's still just looking at us. And so I believe the Lord was my, our, my family's very present help in that time to be our protector. Because it wasn't going to come by my strength when a vicious, full-grown dog was meaning business. And so I'm thankful for that. That God is in the midst of his people, and he chooses to put his focus on us. And the psalmist assured his readers that God was always right in the midst of his people. In Psalm 46, 4 through 5, he described it as God being in the midst of the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. And because God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. Why will she not be moved? Because God shall help her. In light of his promises to fight for his people, God said that through the psalmist in Psalms 46.10, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. He is God and he is God alone. And like Scott was mentioning, yes, we are to do our best. We are to make the most that of any effort that we can put into it to be ready for any troubles that may come as they normally somehow figure out a way to show up and we do all that we can do and you know just because we do all everything right doesn't mean everything is going to go right we can put in our best effort we can do our our best detailed work and it can still come up short and you know we should put our best foot forward you know if you feel a calling that you're going to be a missionary to Africa there should be some steps that have taken place that you are preparing because you see the end result so if you're a missionary to Africa and you're like I know the Lord's called me to Africa well did you uh get your passport No, no, I haven't got that yet. I mean, you made any steps, you know, to take, to plan for the future that you feel like the Lord has called you to? And it's important to make plans. It's important 
to take the necessary steps. But after we have done everything that we can possibly do, after we have put our best foot forward, just like Hezekiah, he ended his work and focused on God. He looked to the Lord who was in the midst of the holy city for the victory. He didn't rely on his own abilities or his own strengths. And Hezekiah was going to town. He takes over, and, you know, he just starts tearing down the idols like Scott had mentioned. He's just living righteously for the Lord. I mean, this is the, this is the epitome of who you want as a king. And so he's just working off of a solid foundation, trusting in God. And even though he had his best foot forwards, we see, and he had a solid foundation of faith, and he was acting on it, the Assyrians' threat seriously worried him. They were cruel. They were terrifying. They were blasphemous. And so Hezekiah's faith, it took a little waver for a moment. And so in a moment of doubt, his and Jerusalem, Jerusalem's fate were um, up in the air. So Hezekiah wasn't just worried about himself. He was worried about his people. And so Hezekiah, he's preparing. He sent some of his officials dressed in sackcloth to the prophet Isaiah. And through the officials that he sent, Hezekiah, he expressed his concern for their lack of strength, their lack of military might. He says, we don't have the power that can produce a winning victory. And he's telling this to the prophet Isaiah. And so he's saying here, they told the prophet, therefore pray for the remnant that still survived. Hezekiah is like, pray, prophet, pray. We need some answers. Things are looking a little shady out there. And we know you hear from God too, so let's make some prayer requests happen. And in response to their effort, in response to their faith in God, this is in response, God gave a word to the prophet Isaiah. And he says, thus saith the Lord, be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard. Because the Assyrians were mocking all of the Hezekiah guys and everyone on their side. And so they were fearful of what they were hearing. Do not be afraid of the words which you are hearing with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. There's an example of a very present help in time of trouble. The Lord shows up just in the nick of time. And so God was essentially telling Isaiah, be still and know that I'm God. Hezekiah, you need to quiet down. You need to stop making such a fuss, such worry, because as you're worrying, I'm still God. Remember your faith. You don't have to depend on yourself. I didn't call you to depend upon yourself. And God was true to his word. He sent an angel to cut off the mighty men of valor. And when the king of Assyria came into the house of his God, he was killed by those closest to him. His own sons came in there and took care of business. God knew exactly what was going to happen. And he already had the answer waiting as we panic sometimes and we freak out. God's sitting watching the whole scene play out. I got gotcha. you. I'm not going to leave you. It's like a dad watching his kid with, releasing him on training wheels. He takes off the training wheels. He's, he's by his side. I got gotcha. you. I'm not dropping you. And even at times, the, some people with the most faith can even doubt and almost give way to despair because of the circumstances in those darkest moments. But even though... Difficult things do come our way. A good gauge is not our circumstances for our, if we're following God or not. So some people think, well, you know, my circumstances are going good, so I must be serving the Lord right. My circumstances are bad, I must be serving the Lord bad. That is not how it always works. Sometimes we see, sometimes 
wicked people in the world living wickedly, and their circumstances sometimes seem fine. In most cases, though, you follow God, you are going to be blessed. It's a, it's a predictable outcome to what could happen, not necessarily for every single case that you are going to be feeling the Cheerios of life, living for the Lord. A great radar, a great gauge to know if you are in the will of God is, is, is are you following the voice? Are you following the word of God? So circumstances don't always dictate whether or not someone is following God. It's their obedience to the scriptures. And so we got another video from Pentecostal Publishing House we want to share real quick. One of the most unique attributes of God that we find in the word is right there in Genesis chapter 1. The Bible says, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Our God is a God of movement. In fact, one thing that I really believe is God is not a monument. God is a movement. We see Him working and moving throughout Scripture on a continual basis. Of course, when we get to the day of Pentecost, we see the sound of a mighty rushing wind. There is movement throughout the Bible. God is always a God of movement. We are told to run this race with patience. We are told to, to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So as there's, there is this constant characteristic, if you will, that you and I, as the people of God, should be constantly moving forward. Paul even said, I forget those things that are behind me and I press forward. I look towards something. Yet there are times in our life that we are to be still and we are to know that he is God. What is it about God that makes us recognize our, oh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Our uncertainty of our abilities, I guess you could say. There are times that I can't force things. I have to just stop and let the God the God of movement, the God of power, the God of continually working together for our good, step in and do what he does best. It's those moments of trials, those moments where we think we could push our way through that God reminds us as he did Moses, just, just stand still. I'm working, I'm moving, I'm, I'm gonna take care of this. And so as you face the various things in your life, know this, you are a person that is to move forward. You are a person that is constantly in motion. But there are times you have to let God do the work because he promised us that he is for us, not against us. And he's got a pattern, he's got a purpose, and he's taking you down a path. So in those times, when you don't know where to turn, stop, slow down, wait for the God that is in motion. We do have a God in motion, and I'm thankful for it. He is looking out for our interests and our best is what his desire is for our life. And so as we look to God for our refuge and strength, the psalmist wants to drive home the point in Psalm 46 by reassuring God people that the Lord of hosts is with us. And he says the God of Jacob is our refuge at least four times in Psalm 46. So in this world and in this life, we face all kinds of troubles, whether they're human, whether they're demonic. But we can be glad we don't have to fight the fight alone. We can be glad there will always be more for us than for them because the Lord is in the midst between us. And so, you know, we should be plugged in to the bank of God's goodness. You know, it's kind of like people that don't, they don't pull from the, from God's resources. They don't plug in to his goodness. It's like having a bank account full and never accessing it. Or it's like maybe, maybe you're in the boxing ring and Mike Tyson's just tearing me up. And you just go into town and I'm like, oh, I got this. And, and God's like, no, you don't. But if you release me into the situation, I'll take care of it for you. And so 
as we have our struggles, as we have our challenges, you may not actually have an army coming your way like Hezekiah did, but maybe it's someone on a job. Maybe they attack you. Maybe they critique your work. They sow seeds of doubt to your integrity. Maybe they undermine your boss's opinion of you and any chances of promotion that you thought you were hoping you were going to get. Maybe you're trying to start a new ministry. Maybe someone uh, doesn't think you have what it takes. Maybe they try to sow seeds of doubt to your pastor and discourages you from getting involved in ministry. Or what if a bully at school is making your child's life miserable? Or what if you feel under constant spirit, spiritual assault from Satan and feelings of temptation and fear or a normal circumstance that overwhelm you? Or what if, what if, what if? There's various ways that enemies come against us. And what do we do in those circumstances? What do we do when the enemy is after us? Regardless of the enemy, regardless of who it is after us, we can be still and know that God is on the throne. He is our refuge. You know, you can claim your promises. You can name it and claim it. I claim it right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, you said that in your word. I'm taking you to the bank on this. That's your word. You said it's forever settled. I'm, I'm holding it up to you. This is your word. You gave it to me. I'm just speaking it back to you. And so the Lord allows us to be a part of that and to cry out to him, just like Hezekiah did. We do what we reasonably can. We make our best efforts. We maybe need to clarify some things to our bosses if things aren't going so well. Maybe if you know, maybe we need to talk to our pastor before jumping to conclusions. Maybe we need to deal with bullies by getting leadership involved. No matter what it is, we can know that God is with us. We want to minimize Satan's ability to attack us. By all means, we want to take some action. But as you do what you can do, we fix our eyes on the one who can make it happen. So we need to confess God's promises that he is our every present help. He is our warrior who fights our battles for us. And we can stand still and see the salvation of God. We can trust in him tonight. Amen. So if you're going through a battle, you've got some things you're dealing with tonight. We can turn that over to the Lord. So why don't we stand together? I know we are dealing with things. If not, we got a week full of, uh, we got a rest of the week that I'm sure is going to have some things. So we want the Lord to be with us and to help us in our time that we can make sure we are having our eyes fixed on him and not our problems. So let's pray before we leave tonight. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you so much for your kindness. We thank you for being our present help today. Lord, in our time of troubles, Lord, you're not uh, a distant God. You're not someone that takes their time in helping us, but you're a loving father, Lord, that you love to help your children. In Jesus, we're thanking you for your promises in your word. We're thanking you that we can claim your promises. We thank you for, Lord, allowing us to know the promises of you, O oh God. And Lord, we're standing on them today, asking you to be with us, to be our refuge tonight, to be our very present help. All those in despair tonight, all those going through things, oh God, that are difficult, all those facing tribulations and trials, we're asking that you would help us fix our eyes on you where our help does come from. We're asking, oh God, that you would just overshadow us with your peace and with your strength, oh God. We're asking that you would go with us this week and help us to see you as who you are instead of focusing on every problem that we have. Let us walk alongside you. Let us walk with you knowing we are protected by you. And we thank you for it. We thank you for being with us and protecting us and being our help, being our strength tonight. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here. It makes a difference. 
go and focus our eyes on the Lord where our help comes from and be encouraged tonight. God bless you. Lord willing, we'll see you this weekend.